Thank you very much, Wieslav. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Isabel, for inviting me. All of you, thank you very much. It's a great honor that I can talk to you in this uh, series of distinguished lectures. I saw some of them on YouTube, and it's it's really a good thing. So I hope mine will be fine enough to be in that series. <laughs> so let's see. I will talk about uh, virtual reality. Uh, virtual reality is a very wide field. It goes from computer games to to other applications in maybe um, uh, brain uh, science and, and whatever, what people could study in a virtual world, which uh, they could better understand, also to interpret data in, in a virtual in environment uh, with a multimodal interface to the human perception. Then they could uh, just uh, rely on data they, they see in a sheet of papers. In this case, we apply virtual reality in room, on room acoustic applications and uh, by introducing virtual sources, virtual instruments, and um, how we can do that will be the content of my lecture. And also it will be the content more to the end, maybe in some 35 minutes, what we cannot do yet. And what's the problem, where's the bottlenecks, where is the next uh, research proposal better place to get some progress for the future. Before I start, I show you where I'm from. This is Aachen. French people know it as Aix-la-Chapelle. It's the city right in the west border between Germany and Holland and Belgium. You see where it is. And uh, our university is an engineering school. It's an institute of technology, basically. And as we say, of course, it's the leading one in Germany. Uh, our competitors are TU Munich, and TU Berlin and uh, maybe uh, Karlsruhe, Darmstadt, but uh, it depends on the ranking, how you look at it. Sometimes we are up front, sometimes others. That's okay. And uh, Wieslaw told about the building. That's uh, on the lower right. You see our photograph of our building. So, uh, what shall we do with virtual acoustics? One might ask, except uh, doing games. For engineering and design, that's quite serious applications for that. So designing a concert hall, designing an urban square, designing a car. Usually people use the decibels or other data to look at. And uh, well, they, if they are well trained in acoustics, they can understand what these data mean, including maybe so-called sound quality parameters such as roughness, loudness, and so on. If they are trained, it's okay. But as soon as they communicate with uh, decision makers, politicians, the public, which, which should be involved uh, in kind of participation in decisions, in decisions about what a city should do. Should they make this highway here or better there? Should they make an airport or, or better not? So that those people don't understand decibels. So if they use virtual reality, they don't look at sound in a way that they look at data, but they listen to sound. So we could get rid of a lot of ambiguities by just communicating sound by as it is, by sound, and not by, by some words or data or other descriptors. And it's a lot of fun. For research, it's uh, interesting as well, because we can create more realistic stimuli whatever, for the task we would like to investigate. It could be a task of interaction between the musician and the room. It could be a task of um, uh, studying uh, neurophysical or physiological responses. It could be included with some uh, specific uh, psychophysical tests and so on. So usually these tests are done with tones, clicks, very simple stimuli. But this never gives the, gives the full picture of the real situation as we usually live in, in a very complex situation, including the environment around us and all these ambient sources which arrive us and which are segregated by our brain into an auditory stream and then separated into objects again, and then we try to identify what, what happens. So also for research, it's a, it's a good thing. And it's fun as well. For music and art, you can't do anything. And it's even more fun. So I hope after this short introduction, you are convinced together with me that virtual acoustics is a good thing. OK, so what I will explain in this talk further is how to create such large scenes. This is actually a square in our city of Aachen, showing the hotel and um, Congress Hall and casino and a park. By the way, this is the Congress Hall where we have the ICA conference in 2019. This was the conference which took place in Montreal in 2013. 
So the next one, uh, ex uh, including Buenos Aires 2016, will then be in Aachen. Another example is, as I uh, already mentioned, uh, aircraft noise, and uh, it could be used also together with other uh, modalities, not just acoustics, but uh, people could study the engine emissions and maybe the influence on the atmosphere uh, of an aircraft in a multimodal setup where the aircraft is just flying in a virtual space and all these uh, consequences of this aircraft approach to an airport in this example can be studied. And finally, what we will uh, focus on most in this talk is uh, the room acoustic situation with some audience, uh, uh, oops, with an audience in this virtual room. Uh, so they are sitting on real chairs, but everything around them is a projection in 3D, by the way. So they can, uh, they can enter this virtual environment, that they can feel at as most as possible in a realistic way, immersed in that environment. So this is, is a small overview. After this introduction, we will talk about the fundamentals and ingredients and what do we need as concerns physics, sound field simulation, uh, signal processing approaches uh, of filter design and then implementation in a way that it's quick enough. So we need, uh, in fact, four ingredients to get from our acoustic data to uh, audible sounds, which includes the sound generation, the sound propagation, the sound reproduction and all the processing part. And we will talk about it one by one, but first about simulation models. So I will not go into any details, mathematical details, just to show about that they have an impression of what's going on there. So in room acoustic simulation, there are several physical approaches possible. It could be very simple, standardized models which are used in engineering for calculating the sound propagation outdoors in an ISO standard or sound propagation in a building between two rooms, which means we talk about sound insulation. And even this very much simplified model can be used as a starting point for a propagation model. Uh, the other end uh, is of precision is the exact solution by introducing wave acoustics. So we start with the Helmholtz equation and boundary conditions and we can use any numerical method which is available, finite boundary, F, uh, finite um, um, difference, time domain methods and so on. But mostly is used, what is on the bottom, geometrical acoustics, which is an approximation, but which is for most cases good enough. So this is known as usually, uh, uh, usually used um, image source models, ray tracing and mixes of that. So where do we get the sources? The sources are uh, the reason for the acoustic waves. The waves can be generated by vibration, vibrating plates, but waves can also be generated by turbulences in just, of, just a flow effect, such as shh. So there actually nothing vibrates here. It's just flow of air. It can be an impact. It can be an explosion, combustion. It can also be uh, a musical instrument, of course, and there is also several approaches possible. It can be physical modeling. If we can understand the ori origin of this uh, sound radiation, we can try to model it. But uh, mostly in our applications, at least in this talk, we start with a recorded sound of existing sources, which could as well be a, a vehicle which sounds while driving on the road, or it could be a musical instrument. And in this way, we focus now on musical instruments uh, for source characterization. There are two uh, or three uh, important uh, parts or components to be considered. One is the sound power. One is the sound signal as such, so the audio sound, what you can hear. And the third part is uh, related to the radiation into space. So not every sound is radiating, not every source is radiating the sound in all directions with the same strength, same amplitude, but some are directional sources, like, like this laser. You know, this is extremely directional. It only makes a point there, nothing, n nowhere else. So this is the extreme. It's a kind of uh, uh, Dirac pulse in the space domain. So there has been work before by Jürgen Meyer, as mentioned, Weinreich, Franz Zotter, Rindel and Otondo, Tapio Loki, 
uh, Gottfried Behler from our lab with Stefan Weinzierl from TU Berlin and Tim Leishman in Brigham Young University. So you see several setups for um, simultaneously measure measuring the sound radiated by musical instrument into all directions. This can be done like this. We, we, need, to, we need musicians. We put them in the center of this setup in a large anechoic chamber in Berlin. And then we ask them to play some tones and we record that. And the rest is uh, calculation, which takes then, after this, is, this is maybe one day, and then we calculate for half a year. This is the setup in our anechoic chamber. We ha have only a hemi-anechoic chamber with a hard floor, so we put some foam on the bottom, which is kind of okay, but uh, it's actually better when we do it in Berlin. And this can be even transported to other anechoic chambers everywhere in the world. So it consists of these microphones. We do not need to go into all these details. And uh, this is another picture finally showing a double bass uh, in this arrangement. And altogether we measured uh, more than 40 instruments. This is one result for the trumpet. At 50 hertz, it, it's, uh, the radiation is... Uh, yeah, more or less omnidirectional, but at 8 kilohertz, it's more like a beam. You can imagine quite easily that it comes out of the cone to the front and it's on axis. Uh, so that is straightforward. For other instruments, such as uh, strings, it's look, it looks more complicated. And uh, as I said, it's still ongoing because we need a lot of corrections. There are so many open questions. So where is the, the center point of the double bass? And this must be corrected then the data must be corrected in order to get these uh, final results. And when it's ready, I can already announce that this will be for open access uh, to be shared by everybody. So you can have this data to use it for your research. This is the list of instruments we have so far. We have also singers from uh, an example with cooperation with the University of Polytechnics in Madrid. And um, this will be shown in one example a little later. Good. Uh, so our third ingredient is the sound reproduction. We simulated the sound propagation in 3D. Usually our geometric acoustic model is a 3D model, so the result is in 3D. The question is what to do with it. And uh, yeah, we can discuss what kind of sound system do we like more to reproduce the sound. It can be any surround sound system, yes, uh, maybe wave field synthesis, ambisonics, uh, uh, VBAP, binaural, and you would ask uh, which one, and I say uh, yes, all of them. Why not? And why not even combinations, as is shown here, for the early and direct sound, which uh, travels the shortest time, which is the early and direct sound, and then maybe the later reverb in a, in a larger hall, in a church even, can be modeled by another method, and this can be mixed in a clever way in order to get the most possible speed of all this, what I do. You will see in a minute why. And uh, on the same, in the same time, the best quality, the best audio quality as concerns the resolution in space, time and frequency. Okay. So the final ingredient is the signal processing part, which means we uh, take the source signal, we have the sound propagation, impulse response, then as we say, we need to calculate the mix of that, which is nothing but, in our example at least, an FIR filter, a finite impulse response filter. The convolution is done in blocks, and uh, there's another discipline, another research area, how to do that as quick as possible with a running audio stream to get that impulse response uh, filtered with the sound signal uh, with uh, low latency. And uh, all. let's go back. All what I told you here, this was one PhD thesis, this was a series of five PhD theses, this was uh, two PhD theses so far, and this was another one. So you can see there's, uh, I talked about it in maybe 10 minutes, but if you add the effort of all these PhD theses, you, there's uh, much work behind. Okay. So now we have all the four ingredients and we put them together and we push a button and then it runs very quickly. This is virtual reality. It's also called virtual auditory display sometimes in, book, in books uh, and uh, it includes three components. 
it should be real time, which means uh, what you put in will be sent to the output directly, immediately. You can compare this with the situation in the television set. So the television is updated usually, it's called frame rate. And what you, when you have a smooth picture, it should be updated as quick as possible in order that the eye doesn't see individual pictures, but a smooth stream of a film. And the update rates are usually, you know that from, from TVs, 50 hertz, maybe 100 hertz. So if we talk about 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, maybe 40, 50 milliseconds, but that's the limit. So everything we do, simulation, source uh, filtering and all that must be finished all these tasks within 40, 50 milliseconds at most. Uh, virtual reality should be multimodal, which means it, we should not just serve one sense, not just seeing, but uh, seeing and hearing at the same time, maybe also haptics, tactiles, maybe temperature, uh, smell, whatever can happen. And uh, it depends on the application of virtual reality, what, what uh, is necessary in our case. Usually we use uh, vision and hearing. And that's all so far. And the third part, so far I talked about the two ingredients, which is okay when we um, discuss a 3D movie in a, in a cinema, which is very popular now, everything goes 3D. But uh, the difference between a movie and virtual reality is that you are part of the environment and not just an observer. In the movie, we are an observer. We are sitting in the audience and watching the movie just from outside. In virtual reality systems, it's interactive, which means, uh, here we go, uh, uh, you can do something in this environment, you can change, modify the environment, you can move in the environment, you can move the sources, and uh, this makes a very big difference as concerns the, the um, uh, impression of realism and the impression of immersion. We come back later to this as well. This is our environment, which is called CAVE. CAVE is just a computer animated, a computer automated uh, virtual environment. Um, and X is just a abbreviation of our French name of our city. Uh, this is uh, a five sided display. You usually enter this with glasses, so you can three in 3D. And uh, only the ceiling is open. So here is the space where we can put our loudspeakers. And it looks finally like this, that uh, loudspeakers are placed there. This is our infrared tracking cameras, um, 3D uh, glasses, shutter glasses. And uh, so some data are given there. It's uh, projected with 24 HD beamers, stereo beamers. So one beamer is responsible for the picture of one eye. So we need two for each angle of view. And the audio system consists of a set of loudspeakers, but not hundreds, but uh, still, still okay with uh, 12 uh, near-field monitor speakers. So that's not an immense um, equipment um, effort. So now we can, uh, this was a development over, let's say, at least maybe 15 years to get there. And it was a hard job to get one PhD to the next, to the next, to the next, without losing any information and losing code or whatever. So, and we, we got that. And one reason is that we have an excellent cooperation with our computer science department, with the people who run the cave, actually, who take care of all the infrastructure and who take care for the visual part. So this is uh, a very uh, important reason. So now we can apply the system. And I will show a series of demos now. The first one um, deals with a church in Spain, which still exists. It's in the city of uh, Baños de Cerrato. It's a little bit north of Madrid, about one and a half, two, let's, two hours north of Madrid, in the province Castilla y León. And um, it's the church of uh, San Juan de Baños. The main um, uh, driver of this project was Antonio Pedrero from uh, Universi uh, University of Polytechnics in Madrid. And uh, they studied how the church was in the 11th century. And in this time, there was a special singing style in Spain. You should know in the 11th century in Spain, there was the Arab invasion. So the Christians could, could perform their religion without any problem, by the way. 
under the Arabs, uh, um, but they were disconnected from Rome, which maybe was good in a way, so they could develop their own things. And this was the starting point of the development of this Mozarabic chant. It's kind of Gregorian, you will hear in a minute, but it's independent of Gregorian and it's independent of the, the church ritus in, in Rome. And this is why it's interesting for historians to check in books what they did, how they, they made the, the Christian ritus at that point. But for the architecture department, which they are architects, it was important uh, from the perspective of uh, history of architecture how the church looked and if it was equipped with curtains or not. Because in some books you see pictures, uh, there might have been curtains. And uh, so this will have a, a very drastic uh, influence on the acoustics. But let's listen to this and let's lo look at the church in our cave. You see the edges of the cave which shows you the displays. This is Frank, our postdoc who finished uh, his job and unfortunately left us few, uh, shortly ago. And uh, this video shows where Frank is in the cave, moving in this virtual room. And we have a monk singing, which was recorded in Madrid with a sphere. And the next step will be that we... That should be enough. Uh, the next step should be that we let the monks move in order to make a procession because there were also historic documents that they maybe have done processions in that because there was connections and openings in the back of the church so they could move. And so this is all open so we can recreate that and let people study whatever they like to do. So I think a very nice project. It will be continued um, with them. The next example is, uh, yeah, let's say, a downscaled version of virtual reality because it is integrated in a well-known CAD environment uh, called SketchUp. So SketchUp is a simple design tool for making 3D rooms. You can introduce textures so that the room looks nice, like this one. And what we did is uh, we added an oralization plugin for that. So then you, this means you get new buttons in this software where you can click on play and then you hear sound. You know, what do you hear? You, you, you hear the sound of exactly this room. Of course, only after having placed a source and a receiver. And this is made for headphones so far. Uh, and uh, as soon as you have done this, you can listen to the continuous sound which is played. You can do something. You can change the oralization settings the surface materials on the fly. You hear the change uh, when you change from concrete wall to glass uh, or wood. You can listen to the change immediately. You can, yeah, as I said, replace surface materials. You can also create new materials with new absorption coefficients, new scattering properties. You can include new objects. You can take a wall and push it away and make the room 10, 10 meters wider. And, uh, and so forth. And you can, of course, move yourself. You can make a film of a path where you are walking and so on. So, last example, or the second but last example, uh, the aircraft, uh, just to show that there's also another application other than dealing with nice signals. This is not so much a nice signal, it's noise. Here's Frank again, Frank Wefers. And uh, so we can play with uh, this aircraft flying around and can study the impact of the noise for the people in various um, locations in the space on the, uh, or in the village nearby or in the airport and so on. Also, um, ongoing project. We hope to get funding for the next step. And finally, our largest, uh, you remember the park with the Congress Center where we have I ICA 2019, so that's it. Uh, we have distributed sources, so-called birds, around us. It's in 3D, with a headphone you would perceive 3D sound. There's another source, the fountain. While we are walking, I'm talking about the sources a little bit. So this is kind of line source, but it's not that trivial as you might think. 
uh, in the far field, it might be modeled by just a point with a directivity attached to it. But when you go closer, you hear splashes which are distributed. And this was studied, uh, it's not a joke, in one master thesis project, how to model a fountain and another, one other source. And it was a big effort to get with close microphones, far field microphones, the best compromise of how to implement this in a, in a virtual acoustic environment. So I hope it is, uh, it is correct with left and right should be. So otherwise you should turn it around in your head. Then, uh, if the dog is barking, please try to identify how big the space is. So, this should be an open space which is quite large. There are some echoes in, and I think it's, uh, it's not too bad. So this is the result of the propagation. Hey, of nice course. to see we you up again. A little bit. How are you? Did you have a pleasant flight? So we go in. The band is already rehearsing, so let's uh, go That's in. another example for an extended source. The opening of the door was recorded in in the same way with distributed microphones in order to have a realistic uh, impression. We speed up a little bit. That's the foyer. This is where usually exhibitions are taking place. Welcome to the Jurgis Aachen. There's a band rehearsing. Okay, and then we go into the concert hall. Maybe you two want to take a look, but please be silent. Oh, Mom, I'm tired of you so. Am liebsten würde ich jetzt Pokémon spielen. Oh je, ich fand wieder Pokémon. Ich würde lieber mein Urlaubsprojekt weitermachen. This was four sources recording in the anechoic chamber. They played together just with uh, one by one with the music mixed of the other players. So one after the other. It was uh, yeah, similar to the minus one uh, records which you could have to play with others. Let's have a listen. Amateurs playing, not uh, professionals of course, but still okay I think. Could be made in the next demo more live with moving avatars, but so far it's just this. So it's updated every, let's say, um, it's about 25 centimeters updated the early sound, the direct sound, every meter or so, it's updated the late reverb and all this fresh up and the calculation with new impulse responses all the time, from the roof is running and so on. So now we are on the balcony. Next example, um, Dirk Schröder was one of our driving forces in this uh, project. He uh, finished his PhD in uh, 2012, I think, if I'm right. Then he went to Trondheim to work with Peter Svensson and then he went to, uh, to uh, Lausanne to work with uh, sig the signal processing and audio group there. And from there we got still contact, of course, and we worked together with them on this project which was a reconstruction of the old Montreux Casino, which uh, maybe you know was uh, destroyed, but uh, it was also an opportunity to use the, the archives of the Montreux Jazz Festival, where they collected uh, 5,000 hours of video and audio from 4,000 concerts. And with this huge database was uh, intended to be used again, to be played again, in the Montreux Casino as it was before 1971 because in 1971 it was destroyed by fire. This is the fire, by the way, who was, which was the, the reason for smoke on the water, deep purple, you know, this is, uh, was composed there. And uh, this is how it looked like. It was a really uh, 
uh, strategy and uh, yeah so what Dirk here's Dirk what they did is they studied old photographs old plans and they made a model of that so now it's very obvious what we do next we use SketchUp and we make based on these old uh, plans a computer model which looks in this case like this and uh, there we can play sources, we can do everything, we can also make a visual rendering which makes a little more nice looking interior, so this is how it might have been looked. Um, and uh, so there's still no sound, but uh, this will be added very soon. So that's the, the visual model. It, it's now um, intended to put that on a screen and to have a small audience with a setup of a surround sound system and to play the virtual sound of the reconstructed Montreux uh, casino in this uh, setup. So there are many issues to be done, so they made a tremendous job to, to do all that. Mechanical construction, then put all the audio together, um, a lot of, lot of hardware and so on, many issues of insurance and so on, because it was part of the Montreux Jazz Festival at that time and the audience could go there and uh, it should be of course, safe to go in this installation. Uh, this is, you see, that's um, a mix of different uh, surround sound systems, VBAP, HOA, direct, reverb, and so they played a lot with that to make it sound good and to make it uh, adapted to that simulation, of course, because uh, it was uh, not any mix of an arbitrary reverb setup, but it was that old Kurhaus in Montreux. This is how the performance was then, so screen and uh, people sitting in the surround sound setup and Dirk was giving lectures about it and it was very well attended. So now uh, if you like to contact them they have just founded a company. Which concludes my examples and I will now talk about the problems. Because uh, what you do is usually you are so excited about a new technology, everybody's working on that and what an, uh, yeah, the, the professor in this case, when he or she is a little bit older, then they start, oh, this is not good and this and this. So we try to, to find the, the, the warmth in our apple and this is what we do now, but there are not too many. So but, uh, it shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be uh, taken um, shouldn't be uh, forgotten about these these problems. So we talked about the. You remember these four ingredients as well, uh, right? So the challenges are here. There are many bottlenecks related to computer science. So we could do more. We could do faster. Latency could, should be lower, and um, we could process more sources at a time. Maybe not just four or ten. Maybe two hundred. And um, I think that's not the main problem. That's the, so computers get faster anyway, and our signal processing is fast uh, already. So and the results are quite exact. We have uh, very nice uh, comparisons with measured or actual real sounds and simulated sounds. If you do everything correctly, it's almost non-distinguishable what is real, what is virtual. But to get this, we need. Uh, boundary conditions of the reflecting surfaces of our environment. We need source data and we need, uh, this is the main physical bottleneck because we don't have these data. And there are two clumsy user interfaces. We could have more inspiration from the people from gaming industry, how to create a virtual world where a game takes place. So just, uh, just make, make us a room with very simple tools and then put a source here, source there, click on a menu and then that's it. So it's not like that. So to make a model, as I showed you with this uh, church in Spain, this takes uh, days, maybe weeks, and that's, that's too much. This is why nobody uses uh, acoustic virtual reality so far, because if you have a problem in architecture or in engineering, in, in noise control, nobody has time for, for this. So there's a lot of work to be done. And that would be another talk. I will not talk more about this. I will more talk about evaluation now, because maybe for you guys here it's more interesting to discuss how does um, the scene appear to the people, what is the perceptual part. And also here I think it's more work to be done. 
So we have to go back to the definition of virtual reality. I told you uh, again, um, already that is, uh, it consists of three different parts. So it's the user interface, the interaction, and the real-time aspect and multimodal aspect. And a, a very important point of the, the, the goal of using virtual reality is immersion. And immersion is also used here in this, uh, in this institute. But I like to ask uh, all of us, what is it? And uh, there is even advertisements around. I, didn't show, I don't show the picture but because I don't uh, like to be sued by them. They, they uh, announced they have a listening experience 10 times more immersive than current technology. So they have a metric which can tell you we have two, we have 20, so it's 10 times more. That's very interesting. And it's about immersive audio, of course. It's all Audio Engineering Society, AES. That's good. Also, they seem to know what it is. And also, we seem to know what it is. Because yesterday was a workshop on three-dimensional immersive audio. So you, do you know what that is? Yeah. I think we can, we can discuss about that. Of course, we have certain feelings about it and uh, impressions and expectations. The technical aspect is in virtual reality research, that the degree, or this is the vision, the degree of immersion can be objectively assessed. So there is a metric for that. And um, on the contrary, the entertainment industry just states uh, covering more than the horizontal plane, so going upwards, including elevation. This is what we had uh, many times in all talks yesterday. Elevation is important to uh, um, increase immersion. That might be a good way to go, but I still uh, don't know if there's a metric. So we made a study in our smaller anechoic chamber, which is still fine for doing this, with a surround sound setup and with an Oculus Rift as the, the, for the visual part. And then we ask a test subject if they are highly or fully immersed or not immersed at all by playing around with our simulation. So this time we use the virtual reality setup for uh, research on perception. So. Um, yeah, to go back to the psychologist's definitions, immersion is a state characterized by perceiving ourselves, enveloped, included, and interacting in an environment. So enveloped is fine. Everybody knows what envelopment is, which is for an audio reproduction quite okay. But we should be included in the environment, and we should interact. We should really feel inside of the environment. This is, goes maybe a little further. So uh, let's see. And... Uh, yeah, maybe I do a little, little uh, quicker now. Um, there has been uh, efforts in spatial audio research by doing psychophysical tests, and uh, by these authors, for example, Wiersdorf, Gustavino, and Katz, and uh, Lindau. And uh, so we put that together. The literature is quite diverse in this case, and immersion is considered to have these four modality or four components, which is causality, attention, room perception, and source perception. And um, uh, you see more references here, more papers um, um, published by other authors here. And uh, what is taken out of this, that uh, we have the approach of a narrative uh, discussion with them uh, to rate different aspects of um, what people feel as components of immersion. And we ask about the, the, feel, uh, the uh, impression of presence. So uh, the data were created in the virtual environment with a high and low level of uh, immersion. And then it was determined some items, which is questions, which correlate with a level of immersion. It was like this. For the component of room perception, uh, it was asked, how intense is the impression that you can estimate the width of the room? So it relates to the room volume somehow. And uh, this is one example of the nine questions about the room. For the source perception, we had 17 items, location, height, separation, extent. How intense is the impression that you are surrounded by sound sources? For the causality, it's uh, how did you feel involved by the acoustic scene? And for attention, it's uh, asked how intense is the impression that your attention was drawn to the acoustic scene in six questions. And uh, this is our SketchUp model again, so by uh, modeling with uh, our software Raven. 
sounds like this. Different sources around us. Somewhat chaotic situation could be in a cafeteria where things are going on and the question is, are we feeling that we are in this room, in this situation or not? And uh, so, uh, there were some examples for the sources. And uh, we start with a, or let's start with a high immersive situation. Uh, this is the, so the, the reference, we could say, the highly immersed um, um, yeah, case, and then we take out some, um, yeah, some complexity and we reduce it. For example, we just take out the reverberation. This should immediately reduce the envelopment because it's more a direct contact with the sources and no more envelopment. And then we low-pass filter uh, the direct sound, which should uh, destroy the, local the localization of the direct sound because it's only frequencies below 150 hertz, which don't have any directional cues in our binaural hearing. And then we uh, distract uh, noise bursts, so psh, psh, which comes immediately without announcing, so this should irritate the people and draw the attention. And then we revert sound samples to make them yeah, just sentences spoken in a reverse way which should irritate the people, which uh, draws them away from any kind of naturalness. And uh, so the, we have two uh, hi hypotheses. Uh, the high immersion scenario will be ri rated higher as concerning the immersion than the low. The LI scenario and also the re reproduction methods, they were compared in this uh, project. Their uh, better spatial audio system should have better immersion. And it should be like this, the immersion should uh, increase with the complexity of the scene, add reverb or not, and so on. And also the reproduction system uh, should have this trend in order to show that uh, more, more sophisticated systems, uh, more than just stereo, are preferable. So this is the reproduction setups. This is our virtual reality lab in our institute. Uh, it's connected with a cave, of course. It's just across the street. And uh, this is the space where we usually do our uh, student projects and all our demos and so on. We also have a screen. It's not uh, full five-sided, but uh, it's stereo, still OK. And we can play around with more loudspeaker setups because this is a rather unechoic room. It's even an ITU certi certified room, listening room. So we, we adjusted it to the reverb time, which is, um, which is standardized for that. So this would be mono. That would be uh, just a crosstalk cancellation with four loudspeakers in order to be able to uh, turn the head. And with uh, HOA, with 12 loudspeakers, we have the horizontal, the median, and the vertical, and, and the, the, the other plane, the third plane, in order to have an HOA. And uh, this is how the test looks like. The sentence is stated, and then you should uh, tick if, if you are, uh, um, agree with this statement, you are fully immersed, yes and no, or that your, your attention is drawn to this uh, noise burst, not at all, or very intense, and so on. And uh, the results are as follows. Our hypothesis is not too bad, so it's uh, the high immersion sample is better than the low immersion sample. It's even significant. The error bars are uh, okay, uh, and uh, so this, uh, that's a significant difference between them, and it's also significant that uh, CTC is better than mono, also in this case. For HOA, uh, the results are a little problematic at the moment, so we should check again what happens there. Uh, it's, um, it can be expected that uh, higher order ambisonics um, is, performs or VBAP performs similarly as the crosstalk cancellation, depends on if it's, uh, the crosstalk cancellation is individualized or not, and which kind of HRTF is in these filters and so on. But this is all details. So the conclusion is for that, the database was created, the hypo hypothesis was confirmed in the first test trial. We need deeper analysis of HOA and uh, also study more among the subject groups. And we will also do objective tests, which means that we don't do listening tests only, but we also use the auditory modeling toolbox in order to identify the binaural uh, representation of uh, what the brain does with this binaural input. And there's a very nice open toolbox which can be used for that. 
This work was all done by Angela Kolzmann, the student for, of uh, psychology from Kiel, and was supervised by Lukas and Michael in our, in our lab. So I have to thank them for this contribution. And uh, yeah, that's my final, my final slide, uh, which gives reference without any further details to an ongoing project, which we call CSIM. Uh, which is a so-called research unit consisting of nine projects in different labs. You see them all listed here. And um, it's now in the fourth, four and, four and a half, or fifth year, and we have still one and a half years to go. Uh, it will be presented, uh, all results of this, uh, finally in the Boston meeting of the ASA next year in June. And um, it uh, contains, yeah, it would be too much uh, to talk about all these sub-projects, but the, the focus of season is to create uh, the best possible binaural recording of spaces, including music ensemble playing, uh, by a dummy head, which can also turn the neck, and uh, while reproduction with a headphone, close by headphone, actually it's a loudspeaker system, like headphone, looks like a helmet, uh, tracked, so the motion is tracked, and while the listener is turning the head, the database picks the data of the dummy head, virtually doing the same, so that you can imagine it's uh, another degree of freedom in that. It's not the full coverage of the HRTF for the static dummy head, but all this and this is another parameter. So, and this is fully tracked. And this is done in, uh, in a recording and also in simulation. And uh, then we compare how close is the simulation to the recording and how do different simulation, simulations compare. And in this aspect, we are launching a round robin, a so-called round robin, which means uh, everybody is welcome to compete uh, with the simulation uh, applied on the same CAD problem. So it will be distributed to all the participants who like to do that and then the results are analyzed by the group in Berlin, by Stefan Weinziel and his, his uh, colleagues, which uh, then evaluate the differences according to a, a recently defined uh, vocabulary for sound, uh, for sounds, the so-called Saki, the sound, uh, the auditory uh, quality inventory. So it's a list of vocabularies de describing sound um, yeah, components or impression. Um, aspects, and also they now they published uh, another one. Uh, Saki is more is more Asian drink, but now they they published Raki, which is Turkish, actually. But Raki is the room acoustic uh, quality inventory. So the sound, the spatial sound inventory, and the room acoustics are um, vocabulary. So this that's about season. Uh, you will hear more about it. You can Google for it. It's uh, Im found immediately. It's a very nice uh, but very large project and a lot of uh, management required. Okay, so to summarize, I show this again. I think it's now clear. We have the four ingredients and we, we like them. We have to work a little bit on the propagation maybe. Uh, this is mainly related to situations where wave effects take place because so far they were completely neglected in geometrical acoustics. Wave effects means we could study modes, we could study edge diffraction. Imagine an orchestra pit in an opera house where you don't see the source, but you hear the source. This, obviously, there's only diffraction possible. And uh, there's another important effect, which is called the seat dip effect, which does not make any difference here because you have a steeply inclining audience, but uh, with a flat audience, there is some spectral effect, which is very drastic, actually, at about 200 or 250 hertz, you have a dip, deep uh, dip in the frequency response, according to a uh, lambda quarter wavelength, uh, quarter wavelength effect of kind of resonance between the uh, rows of chairs. It depends on the shoulders and on the height of the of the seats. So we cannot model this. So there's there's something to do. Uh, in reproduction, of course, we talk about uh, discuss about merging some audio. Uh, reproduction systems in order to get best compromises and for the sound generation there's uh, maybe the biggest uh, construction area so we need more people working on that in any case. Convolution is quite quite nice so that runs quite well. So finally the virtual auditory display 
the acoustic virtual reality should convey basic information about the virtual environment to the user, which means we are immersed. Um, and uh, what basic means uh, depends on the situation. It could be that maybe spectral cues are most important because we like to identify the sound of a musical instrument if it has some special aspect, if the one violin is better than the other, for example. It's not maybe a spatial issue and not a temporal issue, but a spectral issue. In other cases, uh, when we talk about the design of a concert hall and we want to increase envelopment, then it's more the spatial cue which is relevant. And temporal cues might have other, other reasons. So uh, in some cases, maybe all of them are relevant. But we have to study and we have to make sure that the component which is most prominent in our interest, spatial, spectral, or temporal, or all of them, needs to be uh, um, paid attention to mostly. So our efforts must be concentrated on this. Yeah, and uh, finally, my, my opinion is that the field of acoustic virtual reality, which is in the world, maybe developed in some 15 to 20 institutes, they know each other quite well, they have different focus of, uh, from gaming to, to engineering, uh, they are quite well developed and uh, on the other hand, all these people who could potentially apply acoustic virtual reality because they like to discuss with their, among them or with the public, not about data, decibels, but they want to use the sound as it is, as a sound. Why should we look at sound if we have ears? So, but these disciplines, they are too far away from what we guys do. There's a wall in between, and there are, there's a big lack of data and methods and user interfaces to get that such easy uh, computer simulation and audio technology that it's for everybody usable in short time. Then an urban planner, medical doctor, musicians and, and uh, artists in general, psychologists, historians, they can take benefit of that. And this is a long way to go. So we have to break this wall slowly, stone by stone, in order to get that together so that uh, the applications are more spread out to, to basically everybody who likes uh, to have fun. Okay, um, that's it. I have to thank my group, particularly those who are listed here, Lukas, Sönke, Michael, Dirk, Jonas and Frank. The colleagues, uh, not to forget, in the virtual rea reality group in the Department of Computer Science, just across our road, our friends there, and our friends from the CSEN Consortium. And uh, so that's it. If you'd like to visit us, go in here. Uh, that's our building. Thank you very much for attention. <laughs>